Hey there, climate warriors, get ready for another wild ride on Are We Fucked? I'm your host, Lisa Camillo, anthropologist, filmmaker, and your sarcastic guide through the tangle web of our climate crisis. Today's guest is Laura Oldeny, a green living and money coach who is all about exploring money and lifestyle choices for our regenerative future. She helps reluctant capitalists achieve financial resilience on a climate-challenged planet. Laura has been featured in CNBC, Forbes, and Good Housekeeping, so you know she's legit. She's also the author of The Capitalism Survival Guide and co-author of Growing Free, Building the Life of Your Dreams Without Losing Your Soul or Destroying the Planet. Just the title makes me tingle in there. I love talking with Laura about how to stick it to the man by starving capitalism and finding new and alternative ways to build an economy that doesn't destroy the planet. In this episode, she's going to drop a ton of tips on how to save money and build something great with a more community-oriented vision. It's inspiring, it's practical, and it might just make you feel like you can actually do something about this mess of capitalism. So buckle up, grab a notebook, and let's dive in. How are you? I'm well. Hello, Lisa. Thanks for inviting me for this conversation. Oh, thank you for being on the show. I'm very excited because it's a very different perspective. We haven't approached this before. So let's start, okay? Yes. All right. Let's talk about capitalism. How fucked are we? Because capitalism is a bit the root of all our problems right now, including mainly, actually, the environment. So how bad is it? Is it working? (laughs) Well... And I am not a scientist or an economist or a financial advisor or a person who's armed with data or statistics. I'm guiding myself anecdotally by what I see happening in the world around me. I'm a green living and money coach who's really trying to align her money and her lifestyle with her values and helping other people sharing my journey along the way. And so, yeah, I I can't say for sure. I've listened to some of your other episodes. I thought Richard Hainberg did a fantastic job speaking to that. You know, obviously I'm a David Holmgren fan as someone who's steeped in permaculture. So I appreciated his answers as well. I mean, certainly I don't think things are good. You know, can I say that this is leading up to the extinction of Homo sapiens? I don't know for sure. It looks like it. All the brilliant minds are saying that. So let's listen to those, shall we? Yes, it feels like it. it I mean, something's definitely happening. Something's happening where human life and all life on Earth is suffering and struggling and being negatively impacted by this. I will say for me, my efforts... At, and actions are driven by that, I find, and I think we'll get into this more in the conversation, that the more I adapt and tweak my own lifestyle to navigate that, the richer and more wonderful my life becomes. Ah, okay, great. We're going to listen to that soon. So the economy in America doesn't look like it's doing too well, and people are really struggling. We in Europe are doing okay comparatively to the U.S., but it looks like people can't afford food, accommodation, even though they are working full time, one or more jobs, even up to four jobs, and they're still struggling. So capitalism doesn't look like it's working very well. That's certainly my perception. And and my take on it is that it's not working, that it is kind of unfolding and, and coming to the result of late stage capitalism, which if you look at what how capitalism operates is what you would expect to see, where we've we've got this widening wealth gap. We've got the extraction of financial and natural resources, of all kinds of resources, of human capital resources. And for me, in terms of late stage capitalism, what really gets us into that is just this tremendous wealth gap created by unfairly exploiting all of that labor without compensating people for their labor adequately for the value that they've created. So then you get these rising costs and prices and people extracting a greater amount of value and wealth upwards, leaving more and more people with less money. And then pair that with not having good financial literacy infrastructure here 
in this country, plus not having the safety nets that the government provided safety nets that m many European countries have. Yeah. And there are other things as well, but those factors really come together to put us in a very precarious position. Yeah, absolutely. Looks like that the U.S. is suffering more of this latest stage of capitalism. So how do we survive the latest stages of capitalism? Because you wrote a book, tell us how to survive this mess left from capitalism. There are definitely multiple tactics and strategies. And I think one of the first things is just recognizing how capitalism operates and then being aware that, especially in the US, but everywhere, because education kind of unfolded similarly in many different places, that even our education system is shaping us to be good workers, mm -hmm. to not question things. Earlier, we were referred more often to people were referred to as citizens. Now we're more commonly referred to as consumers, even by our own government. Yeah, true. Yeah, I never thought of that. Yes. And recognizing this identity that's being shaped for us, that we're consumers. And how do we step back from that? Because... We're also seeing that this emphasis on consuming and so many other factors, not just this whole lifestyle that capitalism is trying to push us towards, is leaving so many people unhealthy and unhappy and unsatisfied. Yeah. Consumerism just leaves this void in many people's lives. And so recognizing that and then designing your life, making decisions that where you're factoring all of that in and lifestyle choices. And so... For me, and many people, when we step back and think about what a truly wealthy life looks like, it's going to be a little different for each of us, but it rarely is, for most people, a big mansion or a gas-guzzling yacht or a private jet. It's yeah. just more space and time in your life, autonomy over that time to spend it with the people you want to spend it with to be doing the activities that light you up. So recognizing, getting clear on what that wealthy life, that truly wealthy life looks like to you, and then making your decisions as much as possible, even if it's little decisions here and there and choices, that move you in that direction. Because so often that direction is away from the heart of late-stage capitalism. Yeah, it's like AA. You first recognize you have a problem and then you decide how to fix it and want your life to look like. It's funny because I'm in an area that it's full of the riches of the world. We're not, but we are very close to that area. So we have mega yachts, we have the millionaires, the billionaires. And I'm telling you, I know many of these people and they're freaking miserable. They are divorcing or divorcees or they don't talk to the kids. The kids had drug addictions. And seriously, it's not a healthy and satisfied life. I think they said as well that this is back in Australia. After 60000 per year, which is actually pretty average in Australia, whatever you make on top of that, it doesn't make you any happier, no matter how much it is, which is incredible. So you can live with less, with way less, and be happy. So it's very fascinating, this thing. And how do you live like this? What are the next steps of this AA, but for capitalism? Well, it varies from person to person. I do think a big part of it is we've recognized the mainstream narrative, and then we have to get comfortable living a different way and being a nonconformist yeah. and questioning things and, and then finding other people that are questioning things or open to questioning things as well, because it certainly helps and is easier to go on this journey with other people. But I've certainly found in my life that there have always been people around me questioning this and then just getting comfortable making decisions that move you away from that mainstream approach mm -hmm. and exposing yourself to more if you're on social media. One of the things I talk about as a capitalism survival strategy is recognizing the value of your attention capital because we see how much money Mark Zuckerberg, for example, has yeah. made off of people's attention. There's tremendous value in our attention. And so to be cognizant of what we're directing our attention towards and is our, the, the, where we're directing our attention benefiting wealthy billionaires and greedy corporations more than it is us? Yeah, good question. And that, that's not to say we should never be on social media 
or never just scroll and relax a little bit, but we can be very much more thoughtful about how we direct our attention on social media. Are we directing it to content that is helping us veer away from the mainstream capitalist narrative to consider creative, alternative, more fulfilling and meaningful ways of life? to learn valuable skills that will help us spend less money and send less money off to greedy corporations. That is a content that's uplifting us or bringing us down because the sadder and more depressed we feel, the less healthy, the more likely we are to be spending money in that greedy capitalist economy. Absolutely. And so again, going back to these steps, can we start bringing in social media content or whatever content? Is it reading books? Is it the conversations you're having? Can you be directing your attention to these more alternative, I say alternative, just these less common options that are going to be so much more fulfilling? Yeah, it makes sense. Absolutely. Our attention is our capital. It's very important to where we focus our attention to and what brings us joy. And it is true. When you're miserable, you just want to buy something. <laughs> you want to be distracted. You always constantly compare yourself by what people are doing, what people are spending the money on, and you think it's never enough. So you are like this little rat in a cage in those uh, hamster wheels and just keep going and going and going. So, okay, that's great. And what else? Well, that's another good step to take. Well, as you just alluded to, just accepting yourself and it, starting with, to down that path of self-love as uncomfortable as it is because the more you accept yourself and the more confident and comfortable you feel again you're not directing as much money into that capitalist economy because capitalism wants you to feel isolated yeah. and miserable that's where it's getting its money from and connecting more with others is another thing, especially connecting with people that are going to make you feel good about yourself, but just even your neighbors and your community, because the more we can borrow and share, the less we need to spend money and direct our money more towards wealthy people that don't need it. And it also makes us more resilient, you know, when we do have those connections in community, because if and when the shit really does start to hit the fan, throughout the ages, it has been community and people coming together that has really helped us navigate all of this. I'm reading this book right now, Climate Chaos, Lessons on Survival from Our Ancestors. Oh, I love that. And a big part of it is community and connections and how they worked together. And so that's something we need to be building in, in our lives. I talk about multiple forms of capital, you know, so we know financial capital, that's what capitalism drives us towards. But there are other forms of capital in our lives that are also tremendously valued and make us far more resilient. Financial capital is very speculative and fragile. If you think about what financial capital is, it's digits in the ether these days. Like without electricity, you really can't access much financial capital. True, exactly. And the way the markets operate it's up and down. So if we think about like much more tangible forms of capital, which are really what we use the financial capital to access anyways, we can think about the living capital in our lives, the parks, gardens we have in our yards, the air we breathe. We can think about material capital, which would be the laptops and microphones we're using or the tools that a plumber uses or that we use in our garden. We can think about spiritual capital, which doesn't even have to be a religious belief. Yeah. It can be your yoga or meditation practice. And then a big one is social capital. I think social capital is where the true resilience lies. For those that perhaps feel isolated and perhaps around them, they're not the right people. How would you seek your tribe? Somebody that speaks your own same language. Yes, good question. I, this is probably the question I get asked the most. I think... It varies. One thing that's been tremendous for me is permaculture. And just wherever I am, I, I spent a couple of years as a nomad even, but wherever I've lived, I've always started out by even just using a search engine to put in permaculture in whatever town or area I'm living in, because usually there's a group or an organization uh, or a uh, business and okay. there are meetups. Uh, and uh. People are drawn to permaculture, which is this ecological design toolkit. And I heard you explain it, Lisa, in that session with David Holmgren as working with nature 
as opposed to against it, which is so true. And we can do this in all aspects of our lives. Nature's a, this amazing model for mm -hmm. every area of our lives, including our finances. And so yeah, that's where I've always started is permaculture, but even like minimalist meetups. Often people are like-minded. Ah, okay. Where are the people talking about frugality in your area? Or if you have uh, something you're really interested in, it doesn't have to be related even to the environment or minimalism or navigating capitalism. Maybe you like to knit. Maybe you want to garden more. Volunteering at a community garden, you, you don't have to have land to garden. There are so many community gardens that need volunteers, and so often you get to take some of the produce home after you volunteer. You can make these connections. So many people in gardening are open to these conversations more. Absolutely. What else are other aspects? Because you're very practical. I follow you on Instagram, and it's brilliant. You have so many different useful advices you give. So, for example, somebody that doesn't want to just spend money and give it to the middleman how would you in practicality how would you avoid that i do a number of things well for me a big part of it and this isn't going to appeal to everybody but i do a lot of dumpster diving you know mm -hmm. here in america there's unfortunately a tremendous amount of still usable stuff in our waste stream and i dumpster dive at grocery stores i dumpster dive at thrift stores because even our thrift stores in this country are overwhelmed with all the stuff and i dumpster dive at university campuses at the end of the semester when the students are moving out but it doesn't have to be going to dumpsters just looking at the curb there's so much that gets set out at the curb or the alley on trash days i think Starting to recognize more of the waste, and I put waste in quotes because there yeah. really is no such thing as waste. It's just these misdirected resources and poorly designed systems. Oh, I love and, that. Wow, great description. And developing simple repair skill so we can keep things out of the waste stream more. Buying higher quality when you can so that it's less likely to break down. Then again, going back to building community so you can borrow and share loppers are something you use to cut like tree branches and I don't own a pair but my neighbor does and I know where she keeps them and she's comfortable with me using them great and I have a camping cot and she doesn't and so when she goes camping she comes to get my cot and when I need loppers I go get them so I borrow them I'm also a member I'm very fortunate to live in a community with a time bank so a time bank is something where the currency is time not money and you're exchanging time and there are no dollars and the exchange is with the software. It's not directly with the person, it's with the software. And we have our St. Pete time bank. So if I think I need something, especially a physical item that I might feel like I need to buy, I'll ask first in my time bank if someone has one they don't need that I can offer time credits for. Or I'll ask in my local Buy Nothing Facebook group. You know, Buy Nothing groups are around the world. They're a way we can ask for things and offer up things that we no longer need. There are apps out there to help people like Freebie Alert. We can create the Post Growth Institute hosts training for people to convene offers and needs markets in their communities. So you can figure out how to facilitate that conversation and bring people together and tease out what people have to offer and what people need. We just don't talk about it enough. Those resources are out there. We live on a tremendously abundant planet. Capitalism's myth of scarcity is false. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these resources are hoarded and distorted. Well, many of them, but a lot of them are out there and we're just not putting it out there and asking and this creating the spaces for conversations to connect people with the resources. Wow, you're opening a whole new world. It's great. It's true. We have to use the resources we have that are out there and these amazing communities that are doing already something brilliant and that we can tap into that. You know, I talked about the waste stream, but also just recognizing the abundance that is around us, recognizing things for the value they offer. So much is around us that we just take for granted or don't even look more closely at. Like here in the U.S., people will go to a health food store and spend 5 to $10 on dandelion greens and then others are, and maybe the same people, are putting Roundup or pesticides on them in their yard and spending money to get the pesticides, damaging the soil and the plant in their yard, or ignoring the fact that their neighbor down the street may have dandelions in their yard that they're not putting pesticides on, that they uh. could just go get those for free. 
there are so many weeds, again, quote unquote, that are so nutri highly nu dense in nutrition. Wow. And then instead of harvesting those or taking advantage of them, learning about them, we go spend our money at stores where the food is not as nutrient dense. That's true. And all of these fallen fruits and things around us, there's just so much around us that we don't take the time to stop and give ourselves space to think about. How could I use this? Not to over harvest and abuse and extract all the time, but just to develop that mindset and that skill is so vital. Brilliant. Yeah, it's true. And we don't know all these things and they don't teach us this. We currently live in Italy and it's a bit of a dichotomy because from on one side, it is like that society where it's very supportive. My husband, for example, he's a chiropractor and every time he comes home, he's bringing some wine, some wild boar, olive oil or, or honey. It's amazing. All these people producing stuff, they just bring him gifts. I love this about this community. But at the same time, we don't buy secondhand stuff. I remember university, I furnished my whole house. I love that and loved also painting old furnitures and upcycle them. You have fun and you are satisfied by your work and you got something for free, which is brilliant. But here in Italy, oh no, it looks bad. People's going to think we are poor. It's all that facade of let's pretend because it's more important than actually something practical that we might need. It's crazy that mm -hmm. we work that way. How we fight this mentality. Yes. I mean, for me, I guess I'm farther along in this journey. It's important enough to me that I am very much less concerned about what people think. I think that's a big part of it. We've got to get over what the mainstream narrative is, what people think. What people think is really damaging the planet. And it's damaging to human life in the future. It's true. So how important is it to you? You know, how far are you willing to go? For me, when it comes to buying new things, especially little things that people aren't likely to use that long, like with all the dumpster diving I do, I see how much ends up in the waste stream. So I often think about what is the full life cycle of this product and what's going to happen to it when I'm no longer going to use it. Is it going to be just another item in the waste stream, in the dumpster? Am I going to be able to pass it on this to someone else that might use it? But again, I mentioned nonconformity earlier. I think that people have to start stepping more away from it and getting more comfortable with not having the most updated kitchen or bathroom. That's just a big part of the problem and that whole mentality around it. I know that's a big thing to step into, but even like making choices, those kinds of choices in little places in your life and building up to that. Absolutely. It's very true, actually. We, yeah, we are that way. If we find something that can be useful, we'll grab it. We're not scared, but there is still this, what can people think if they think we're poor? It's it's terrible mentality, but we're trying to fight it. Absolutely. Because the world needs a new paradigm, a new way of thinking. What do you think are thinking younger generations because you're in contact with them, right? Because you are on Instagram. Are they receptive? Gen Z, Gen Y? I'm a millennial, so I can't speak. I'm sort of between the two generations. So what do you think? I think certainly some of them are. I think they're a bit scared and overwhelmed. But I mean, based on the comments I get, you know, I don't interact with that demographic daily in person. I, I get lots of like, this is so inspiring. Thanks for walking the walk and showing us the way. I think they're looking for role models. And, and the more of us that can provide that example to them, the better. But I do think many of them are quite open to it. I just don't know that they see a clear roadmap yet or that it, it truly is possible. For me, again, I go back to what I've said earlier and have come to a couple of times. So much out there making us lonely and isolated and miserable. And the, again, from my personal experience, the more I separate myself from that, the more I design a life that doesn't include the consumerism, the isolation and to build community, the richer and more resilient, thus my website, Rich and Resilient Living, the more rich and resilient, truly rich and resilient, I feel. And I'd like to continue the conversation, but playing off this idea of rich and poor and money. My message is not that money is bad. Certainly, I do not 
I'm discouraged and disheartened with how what has unfolded through capitalism, but I'm not telling people to avoid money. In fact, I think that those of us that are concerned about capitalism and our environmental future can step up to money to earn money in regenerative ways through regenerative right livelihood and then be stewards of that money and direct it towards the solidarity economy, the regenerative economy, our local economies. We all want to live in vibrant communities, but for so many of us, investing means sending our money off to Wall Street or, mm. you know, whatever the stock exchange is in your country, but it's leaving your community. It is so much easier to send your money off to Wall Street and somewhere else than it is to invest in our own local communities. But people are working on that. And we can work on that in our communities and find ways to invest in our own communities. We can invest in the solutions. We can invest in whether it's renewable energies or other things that are addressing our climate needs. Why are we sending our investing dollars off to continue funding the problems? Absolutely. Yeah. That are negating the future that we are investing to be prepared for. So there's a better way. And permaculture, again, which we discussed, and this is what my co-authors and I talk about in our book, Growing Free. And for us, free stands for financially resilient and economically, ecologically, and ethically empowered. We can be making investments. For me, part of my retirement planning is investing in soap nut trees. And I'm putting them in my yard. So soap nut trees, that literally produces a kind of nut, although that's not the technical term for it that produces a saponin that you can use as a, a cleaning solution, a laundry detergent, oh, wow. you could make it into shampoo, you know, uh, just a cleaning solution. We could invest as communities together in a seed press to make oil from some kind of, like from an avocado seed or something that whatever grows in our communities. We can, we can come up with these community investments. Maybe someone wants to build, instead of an, a, an additional small house on their property, Maybe if they have the right zoning for it, they could build a small commercial kitchen on their property. Mm -hmm. And then people in their community, local food producers, could come in and use it. And that person would earn money for hosting it. And then the local food producers would have a way, an affordable way, to use a resource right in their community and then sell their products. I mean, we just have to really shift the way we think. But we can make these strategic regenerative investments. Wow. Very creative and very community oriented. It's really fantastic. Wow. Michael Hogger was telling me about you and he told me she's brilliant. You'll see. And I'm very happy. While we are at it, give some more examples of this so we can try to train our brain to think in that direction. What else can we think about and diverting our resources and, and earning money from our community, with the community? Sure. So here in the United States, there are a number of communities that have come together and formed what are called slow money chapters. Slow money is this idea of being open to a lower, slower rate of financial return and investing in the local food shed. So maybe a farm or a local food business but making capital more easily available and affordable to them, but just knowing that you're investing in your local food shed. So again, even just starting to have these conversations in your community, whether it's a slow money chapter or it's the lion model in, in Washington state, where people who are interested in investing in their local economy, they facilitate connections with local investing opportunities. There are so many models. There's a book called Put Your Money Where Your Life Is, and it's all about local investing and creating local investing infrastructure. So people can look for that book if they want to read it and learn more or just start reading more online about local investing and get different ideas about how it's happening around the world and what might be applicable where you live. There are crowdfunding websites and you can look for where businesses, it's not just a donation, but some of these are like crowd investing websites so you could earn a financial return. Now again, it's investing and I am not a financial advisor and disclaimer for everyone's sake, this is not investing or financial advice. I'm just sharing with you some of the options that exist. But here in the US, there is a website called WeFunder and it, most of the businesses available to invest on there are mainstream, but at one point, one of the investments that was available was in a Native American food company. 
Oh, wow. You know, so that was an investment I made. You can filter these. Yeah. Is there a, an investing opportunity in your town? Is there an investing opportunity in a more sustainable business? We don't have to send all our money off to these extractive, harmful investments. Absolutely, you're right. Thinking about it, actually, here in Sardinia, we have a currency, like a time currency, mm -hmm. where it's called, this is Sardinia, so it's Sardex is the currency. So they actually send you a sort of credit card. And so, for example, I can shoot an ad because I'm a filmmaker or I do some photography, whatever. Then I don't get money, but I get credits on my card. So I go to all this list of providers or other services and I use that credit on something else. That's fantastic. It is. Yeah, it was huge. It was also on the New York Times. It was pretty brilliant how they did it. And it's still going on. So like, I have to sign up with them, actually. <laughs> you reminded me that. Yeah, local currencies are fantastic. A number of them, unfortunately, here in the U.S. have gone the wayside. It sounds like Sardinia has done it well, where they've been able to put it on a card and digitize it more. So, yeah, I'm ho hopeful that more communities will look towards the Sardex example, because that sounds great. Any messages for young generations? You already gave some brilliant messages, but anything more? I guess I would just underscore again that we don't know what lies ahead. But I don't see any drawbacks, or I haven't experienced them, in designing ourselves more and more out of the capitalist economy and into this more regenerative, solidarity, local-based economy. And that's a wrap to Climate Warriors. A huge thank you to Laura Aldeny for joining us today and showing us how to give capitalism the middle finger while building a resilient, community-focused future. You can check out more of Laura's work and get your hands on her books at richandresilientliving.com. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at arewefact underscore the podcast for more updates, behind the scenes content and memes to keep your eco-anxiety in check. This episode series is produced by Against the Tide Films. To learn more, visit our website at againstthetidefilms.com. Tune in every Wednesday for a new episode. Subscribe, rate us and set a reminder so you never miss an episode on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Take care and remember, every dollar you don't spend feeding the machine is a step towards a better world. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged and keep fighting the good fight. This is Lisa Camillo signing off. Keep your money in check, support local and seek it to the man. The future is ours to shape. <laughs>